Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum, the international congress that provides a platform for more than 1,500 media representatives and experts from the fields of politics, culture, business, development, and science. Welcome to Bonn, the UN city of Germany. These delegates design interdisciplinary approaches to meeting the challenges of global problems and explore how the media can play a central role in investigating and communicating solutions. The three-day conference program contains more than 50 panel discussions, workshops, interactive presentations, and exhibitions, as well as attractive leisure events in and around the World Conference Center in Bonn, Germany. It is great for me to be back uh, in Bonn. You feel a mission. In which we launch a one-year campaign. You get very, very useful information. Highlight uh, what is actually happening in this world. Between uh, journalist advocacy and diplomacy. To actually push the issue rather than try and push themselves. The challenge is uh, the question of democracy and elections. Keep that alive and build a more stable and more transparent and accountable democracy. The so next time you must join us. Thank you. Each year, the conference focus is on a different issue related to media and development. In 2008, the conference theme was media and peace building and conflict prevention. In 2009, conflict prevention in the multimedia age. The topic in 2010, the heat is on, climate change and the media. 2011, human rights in a globalized world, challenges for the media. For the participants from more than 100 nations, the forum has offered excellent opportunities for conversation and exchange. As a result, an international network of experts has developed. Culture, education, media, shaping a sustainable world will be the topic of the upcoming conference in 2012. How can the media serve to enhance awareness of the essential importance of education for a sustainable development of our planet? Engage in our international network. Be part of the solution to global issues and become a member of the Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum family. Thank you very much and a wonderful good morning to you. And congratulations, you actually got up and you're going to be part and parcel of an absolutely fantastic plenary discussion in which you, ladies and gentlemen, can actually take place. Uh, of course, I've informed my esteemed panel that every participant here at the Global Media Forum is keen to engage in discussion, uh, wants to know uh, from the horse's mouth in the true sense of the word. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at the morning of the third day, so you saw the intro film, and next year it's going to be you who is uh, part of that intro film of next year's Global Media Forum. But we haven't uh, progressed that far, even though we have progressed. And of course, you know, ladies and gentlemen, that we cover this event uh, closely on Twitter. And um, you, if you don't want to sort of get up and put a question to our panelists uh, yourself, you always have the chance to do that via Jana, and I'm not quite sure whether I would prefer to do it via Jana. So uh, go to Twitter, hashtag DWGMF, and put in your question, your remark, and whatever, and uh, we'll have Jana sort of come in to the discussion from time to time. Third day at three o'clock, we can all sort of uh, walk out of here and uh, look back at three days of fantastic discussions, hopefully some learning, hopefully some new ideas, hopefully a lot of new friends. My new friends are sitting here, so I'm changing my hat from MC to moderator now. And um, we've decided to run this session a tad differently uh, from some of the others, um, because uh, one of our speakers was actually in Rio last week, and um, therefore I would like to put the challenge to Professor Pogger to give us a little bit uh, of an account of what Rio has already done, or hasn't done, uh, as regards to the topic uh, that we're going to be talking about. You all know that we're talking about education, one of the topics here, and sustainability, but sustainable development. 
Everybody here has a different outlook on that. I'll be introducing the panel in a moment. First of all, I'd like to roll out the red carpet to Professor Thomas Pogge, who some of you might know, some of you might not know. For those of you uh, of the latter, um, he is one of the few philosophers of modern age who's actually concerned not just about some abstract notions, but about issues like justice, how are we treating the poor? And normally one would also expect a professor to be sitting somewhere in an ivory tower and thinking. Uh, this man, ladies and gentlemen, is very difficult to catch, so we're really happy to have him here this morning because he's sort of uh, somewhere between Australia, between some of the six countries uh, where his uh, and his uh, students are conducting some of um, the studies on the global health impact fund that he is planning and proposing. And there are a number of other things. Um, I think your sort of first hat is uh, with the University of Yale. Is that still the case? Right. Do they ever see you there? <laughs> they do. Okay, fine. Now, we are very privileged to have you here. Professor Fogger, please share with us your thoughts on the role of education, the poor, and has Rio actually brought a touch of an advance on these issues? that I can see. Okay. So uh, the development of the human species poses very substantial dangers. These come from new technologies, most obviously weapons of mass destruction, and they also come from environmental change, most obviously from global warming and the depletion of natural resources. Life on this planet has existed for four billion years, animals for 600 million years, humans for two and a half million, and for the last 13,000 years, we've been the only human species on this earth. Compared to the length of these periods, the dangers we face are rather immediate. Climate change and resource depletion can bring devastation within a century or two, and major wars could bring irreversible destruction even within just the next decade. In the face of these dangers, humanity needs concerted action with intelligent leadership. And Rio has shown quite clearly that we have neither. And also that most human beings have a very poor understanding of the issues that are facing us. The immediate reason for this poor understanding is that the political economic elites governing this world have much at stake in a continuation of the status quo. They lead quite privileged lives. They have short time horizons. They're most able to protect themselves if things go wrong. Directly or indirectly, these elites control the media and the national education systems. And so the basic message we see and hear all around us is that everything is under control, that appropriate measures are being taken, that we should not worry about the sustainability of our human future. It is time, I think, for us passengers on this Titanic to become worried enough to get a second opinion. Now, what would such a second opinion contain? It would start with the question, sustainability for whom? Already now, species are going extinct by the thousands at the fastest rate in all of planetary history. Already now, rising seawaters due to melting ice caps will definitely obliterate some island nations by the end of the century. Already now, some 18 million human beings die from poverty-related causes each year, accounting for about a third of all human deaths. While average household income in the world is well above $5,000 now per person per year, median household income is only about $500 per person per year. So that means half of the human beings in this world spend their lives on less than $10 a week. I'm pretty sure that none of them made it here today. Diverse a crowd as we are, we all belong to the top half of the human population in terms of income. Now to be sure, as the World Bank keeps reminding us, money buys more in poor countries. So people at the median can buy as much per week as Americans or Europeans can buy with say $25 or euros or 30. Still, the poorer half is incredibly poor. 
Though they are 50% of the human population, they have only 3% of global household income, not even 3% actually. And this inequality is still rising rapidly in most countries and also in the world at large. The share that the poorer half of the human population has of global income is shrinking and has been shrinking throughout the globalization period since the end of the Cold War. The income share of the poorest quarter, for example, has shrunk from 1.16% to an incredible 0.78% of global household income between 1988 and 2005. Now, this sort of increasing inequality and marginalization of the poor has consequences. The number of chronically malnourished has increased from 788 million in 1996 to about a billion today. I mention 1996 because that was the year in which the World Food Summit in Rome took place and the leaders of the world promised that they would halve this number by 2015 from 788 million to 394 million. Now the year 2015 should sound familiar to you. That is the year in terms of which the Millennium Development Goals are formulated. One thing you don't know, probably, is that these Millennium Development Goals, the first one in particular, is a diluted version of the promise of Rome. What we are now promising in MDG 1 is that we will half the percentage of chronically undernourished people in the population of the development, developing countries between 1990 and 2015. That raises the target number from 394 million to 596 million, and so that is now the new number, according to MDG 1, of chronically undernourished people that will be deemed acceptable in the year 2015. We are not going to achieve that number either, but at least our failure will look a little less embarrassing in terms of MDG 1 than in terms of the World Food Summit uh, promise. Now, I've got no time to speak about solutions, but let me say two things about where solutions ought to be sought. What we need are first and foremost better global governance institutions, which include the voices of the global poor. We also need better global rules that better reflect the interests also of the poor majority. To get there, we need a better understanding by ordinary people of what is really happening in this world. And hence, we need educational institutions and mass media to play a crucial role in propagating this better understanding, despite the fact that they're increasingly commercialized and therefore tempted to defend the status quo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would you care to join me here in the round, um, maybe on my right side? And uh, seeing that fortunately we have uh, a number of women on the podium, I would like to sort of make what we call in Germany a colorful row. <laughs> and uh, I would like uh, to invite the representative of the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development uh, from Bonn. She just had to come from around the corner, is that correct? Yeah. Uh, Ursula Miller to take this space and uh, we'll be talking uh, about the German strategy and the German uh, policy directed towards education worldwide in a second. I would like uh, to invite uh, Dennis Goldberg to the middle seat. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Goldberg has been here a number of uh, years, certainly last year, and uh, having been a, um, a member of the ANC for quite a number of years. Uh, he's now what we term a social activist, and the wonderful thing is his uh, NGO from Britain for South Africa is called HEART. We'll talk about HEART and the heart of education in a moment. Thank you. 
and in Germany the organization, and of course he's got many, many awards, so uh, that's also quite nice. So that means that we're going to continue with a wonderful lady, Christiana Falcone. She is, uh, she's got two hats. Uh, she is uh, both senior advisor to the founder and executive chairman of the WEF, the World Economic Forum in Davos, Klaus Schwab, uh, and she's also advising the Inter-American Development Bank, which has quite a lot of money for development, mostly in South uh, America, and and some part of that money is being spent on education. Last but not least, I'm very happy that he's come here from Frankfurt. Uh, he is the boss of the Frankfurt Book Fair and probably um, already sort of gearing up to October, Jürgen Bors um, and the Frankfurt Book Fair being a uh, proper corporation, being a proper uh, sort of money-making institution, also has identified um, its uh, corporate social responsibility, and that, of course, is uh, directed to education, which gives me the time to sit down, and uh, maybe um, let's kick off. I have invited these people to sort of answer a bit more in detail for the first question, and then we're going to sort of go into a bit more of a discussion. Um, Ms. Miller, let, let's kick off um, uh, the uh, BMZ, um, the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation, has decided and has put education very high um, on its uh, list of priorities. Why? Well, thank you very much for inviting me to today's panel. Actually, you expected Secretary of State of the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, Jürgen Beerfeld, to be in this chair. However, he is tied up in the budget committee today because it is important to have funds for education and Germany is the second largest uh, contributor, according to ODA statistics uh, worldwide, to education. And thank you for the opportunity to share with you some views on the cross-links between education and sustainable development. I think Sustainability has three fundamental preconditions. First, thinking. Second, feeling. And third, doing. For that, I and you and all of us need opportunities and the freedom and the chances. For people to make full use of their opportunities, education is essential. Education is the key factor for individual development and for the better development of our societies as well. Education helps individuals realize their potential. It enables people to take control of their own lives, make self-determined decisions and participate in their societies. In school or in other educational settings, students learn about how their behavior affects their ecological environment and they learn about sustainable lifestyles and social competence. Education and training promote employment. Individuals find better jobs and lift themselves out of poverty for example, each year of education increases a person's income by 10%. National economies can better achieve sustainable economic growth with a well-trained workforce. And education strengthens, for example, innovation and ownership. We all had a to look at the, um, the video in the beginning about conflicts, and I believe that inclusive and conflict-sensitive education can strengthen cohesion within societies, and education positively affects development in other sectors. For example, maternal and child health can bring fundamentally imp fundamental improvements by education. Bearing in mind this key role of education, the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development has made education a key area of German development policy. Last year, we launched our own education strategy 2010 to 2013. 
It's titled 10 Objectives for More Education. And we promote a holistic approach to education, meaning we address all areas of education from early childhood to basic and secondary education to vocational training to higher and adult education. And we support all forms of education, formal, non-formal, and informal. Finally, central issues are access to education and the quality of education. The quality of the inclusiveness of educational systems and the inclusion of all stakeholders as well as partners in civil society and the private sector. Sustainable development is the goal of all our efforts in development cooperation. It cannot be achieved without education. And in that sense, education and sustainable development are inextricably linked with one another. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for kicking us off uh, on, on the German position um, on education and in development cooperation. Somebody who's living and walking the talk for the last uh, many, many decades, but especially for the last 17 years with your organization HART, uh, is Dennis. Um, HART actually stands for Health Education and Reconstruction Training. How much education have you been able to spread and how much is still necessary? Uh, when we talk about sustainability, if it's a never-ending process, is education also a never-ending process? Uh, thank you. <coughs> Actually, I've been involved in education from the age of six years when I was being taught. And one of my first books at school was about food, clothing, and shelter for people everywhere. I remember pictures of the Nile and camels and tropical Africa and of Eskimos in igloos and, of course, people in South Africa in their traditional structures, now called huts, but they were traditional structures in their homes. Now, I've been asked to talk about education and sustainable development. I don't want to sustain this world. I've been an active revolutionary all my life to help bring about change, to make a world fit for human beings. One of the things missing, well, hardly mentioned in the statement about the German position, is that it sounds as though we're talking about technical competence to enhance the economy, but we're not talking about how do people live together? How have we changed our values as human beings? You know, it's only 1947, 48, with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that we accept that all people are born equal, universally. We haven't achieved it yet, have we? The recent conference in Rio shows we haven't got there. And the figures that Professor Pogo has put to us shows we're going backwards. And therefore, I don't want to sustain this world. I want to change this world. And if we're going to change the world, then our education has to be different. Mm -hmm. In a way, since before prison, and I spent 22 years in prison as part of our struggle to free South Africa from apartheid racism by law, I trained young soldiers in our struggle for freedom. I'm very proud to say some of them are political activists today, because I wasn't a soldier, I was a political activist. I was concerned about social change. Uh, I talked politics. I talked. How do we create a society fit for human beings? Non-racist, non-sexist, for me, socialist, meaning equality, and so on. Then I spent a lot of time in prison having time to think. You don't have time for much else. You don't do much else. You dream, you visualize, you study, you read, and you come out and you have a hunger to teach. And you have a hunger to teach about a world fit for human beings. I sat for, at breakfast like one of the heron folk this morning. It was delightful on the banks of the Rhine, having a wonderful breakfast. 
and I recalled coming out of prison in South Africa and flying to Europe in a jumbo jet over East Africa, which had had a drought for 10 years. And I was served a meal on this plane. It was so delicate, so beautiful, in little china where um, little bowls and things, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, so elegant. And looking out of the window and realizing there were people who hadn't had a crop for 10 years. And this reinforced my need to come out and be active again. And I think we need education in the sense that I've been involved in is non-formal, non-curricular education. I think this is my 34th lecture tour in Germany mm -hmm. because you people need educating about these things. All the rich countries, <laughs> like the United States, like Canada, like uh, England and France, and oh, Scotland's a separate nation almost, and so on. I've done them all. And I go on talking about the rights of human beings, the right to a full stomach, the right of children to formal education, but formal education for me is not just maths and physics for the economy. It's about living together as human beings. I've spent my time trying to bring about change. Sustainable, yes. I don't want to talk about sustainable in the technical and climate change sense. What is permanent about our world, climate, technology, is change. The climate has been changing for from the ice age 20,000 years ago to now. I know you want to cut me short. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I just I, see I you, give you going moment. into a direction a that, that uh, is okay. sort of on the climate change bit. But you, no, you no, said I'm something... I'm not going to talk about climate change. It's the one thing I will not talk about. Because I lived in England and they never stopped talking about the weather. <laughs> I want to talk about serious things, social things that exactly. we can affect. And, and that's where I would like to pick you up on. Uh, you said this beautiful sentence, um, you try to change education and you want social change. Now, which way round does it work? Do you have to have social change to have better education or do you have to have better education to have social change? Well, first, let me say about the media, and I'm not speaking about any particular channel like Deutsche Welle or any other channel. What appalls me about the information that is pumped out is the way that serious issues are trivialized. We have uh, a person dies somewhere, or a pair of, what do you call them, Siamese twins, connected babies are born, and it takes up hours of television time. Thousands of people are being killed in Vietnam, in Napalm days, in different ways now in Afghanistan, and we have a fleeting mention. A thousand people died, 500 people died. Why? Why don't we analyze? Why don't we talk? Do we leave only to the printed media, print media analysis? Do we only have, forgive me, Connie, a, a discussion where one has a few minutes between people and then say we've analyzed the situation? I hope not. I hope that we take it seriously. I hope that when this is broadcast, we don't then seg into an advert for coffee of a new brand, because that makes what we've been talking about, like taking afternoon coffee for the wealthy, you see. And this concerns me for the media as a whole, especially the commercialized media. And I'm delighted to say that um, uh, Professor Pogger said what I would have liked to say. He says it more elegantly than I do. But I agree, too. It's great to have a vision about what society must be. But we must change it. Mm -hmm. We must do it. Mm -hmm. And the action and the doing are crucial. When I say we, I mean you and you and you and you. It's not enough to come here and listen to us. You've got to go and do it. You've got to change the world. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dennis Goldberg. <laughs>